I'm Corporal Christiana Halsey. And I'm Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie. And this week on Navy Marine Corps News, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower gets underway for an historic deployment. The fleet's in to celebrate Fleet Week in San Francisco. And we'll show you how to keep your holiday spending in check. Join us for these stories and more on Navy Marine Corps News. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower gets underway for an historic deployment. The fleet's in to celebrate Fleet Week in San Francisco, and we'll show you how to keep your holiday spending in check. Join us for these stories and more next on Navy Marine Corps News. Welcome to Navy Marine Corps News. I'm Corporal Christiana Halsey. And I'm Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie. World attention turned to the Arabian Gulf earlier this month and focused on the initial response of the Navy Marine Corps team, which is operating forward from the sea to deter Iraqi aggression. But for the crew of the guided missile frigate USS Reed, the possibility of war was temporarily overshadowed by a sudden dramatic encounter. Petty Officer Michael Meredith has more. It was October 12th. The USS Reed was directed to intercept and board a Liberian-flagged oil tanker. Katerina P. was a possible United Nations sanction buster and believed to be illegally exporting Iraqi oil. The Reed responded, but ran into problems when the ship's master initially refused to let them on. We were basically looking at the situation. If he's not going to lower down a pilot ladder, well, how the heck are we going to get on board there? Several discussions included using grappling hooks and just plain pulling ourselves on up, uh, maneuvering the ship, uh, a few other ideas like that. And finally, he gave in to allow the boarding team to come on. And then once that was done, I found out that all the discrepancies were on board here, that he was going to be diverted. The next challenge then was to, all right, will you cooperate with us to get the ship underway? And basically, he would not. Once boarding details were worked out and the team got aboard, it was discovered that the ship had no log entries after October 5th, no manifest, and no paperwork for the cargo. The decision was made to divert the tanker. 10% of Reed's crew would be needed aboard the diverted ship to ensure compliance. It impacted almost every watch section. Well, a lot of the crew back over on our ship, you know, they're, they're having to stand more of a port and starboard or a three section watches. Um, that's giving them less sleep. Uh, the MSs, for example, are having to get up earlier in the morning to, you know, cook more food to send over on the rib boat transfers. Um, they've been great. They, they've done a really great job supporting this uh, whole effort here. Preparations were made to get Katerina P. underway. That's when it was discovered that the tanker's crew had taken actions to prevent the ship from moving. But the Reed's engineers quickly overcame that obstacle when some of the crew members stepped forward to assist. The interdiction was a success and gained Bravo Zulus from the CNO, Com US Nav sent, and congratulations from sister ships. That's pretty good, you know, the CNO personally says, you know, to your boarding team, says job well done, that's, that's something. You know, and then Admiral Red, you know, he's... He's a big guy out here, you know, he's, he's the admiral, so it's nice to know that somebody up there appreciates it. With the Katarina P now under the watchful eyes of a U.S. Navy security detachment, Reed has the satisfaction of a job well done. For Navy Marine Corps News, I'm Petty Officer Mike Meredith. While well, USS Reed conducted its dangerous but successful operation enforcing U.N. sanctions, the rest of the Navy Marine Corps team in the area continued their show of force. That team includes 2,500 Marines, most of them deployed from Camp Pendleton. They're conducting exercises in Kuwait's desert, sharpening their skills and showing Iraq just how prepared they are. Their actions aren't going unnoticed. For those that are there, uh, number one, you're doing your job splendidly. Uh, people back here do know what you're doing. Our eye is on you. We are aware of how well you're handling the various demands that are on you. And number two, the means in which you got there and the response in which you, uh, you uh, responded to the call is, is exactly what we're all about, readiness. The Commandant was directing his comments to the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit. There are aboard ships off the coast of Kuwait and on the ground conducting exercises. And they're digging into the desert again because Saddam Hussein started acting up. Mm -hmm. Even while our Marines were inbound, Iraq was sending tens of thousands of troops to the Kuwait border. So the Marines weren't quite sure what they'd find when they landed. Marines of the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, inbound by helicopter from USS Tripoli, they're heading to Kuwait. 
with Iraqi troops still massing on the border, many Marines were wondering just what they were in for. They expected hot blowing sand, but there was no sign of Iraqi soldiers. They did encounter, though, an army of a different sort, the media, photographers and reporters from around the world. The press has become a part of the modern battlefield. Roger that. Expect the enemy, and instead you'll find cameras and microphones. They may not carry weapons, but... You guys sitting there asking all the questions I didn't want to ask. So what is the media doing here? I'm here to cover the war that isn't going to happen and the training that is. And what are you here to cover? Whatever happens, if anything. Iraq's army did pull back from the border, so if there isn't going to be another war, exactly why are these guys here? Why does your organization think it's important to, to cover the exercise here today? I really don't know, <laughs> tell you the truth. <laughs> But seriously, most reporters do think it's important for them to cover events such as this because the media has become one of the military's messengers. Because I think you're sending some signals to people, to Saddam Hussein, to the Kuwaitis that you're protecting them, and to the American taxpayer that they're not wasting their money on the U.S. Marines. I think it's terrific. I think we're part of a modern scene now, and I'd much rather you fought your wars through the media than at the point of a gun. And that's how the military feels, too. That's why cameras are allowed to cover exercises such as this. And that's why cameras will continue to follow Marines as they march down the road. You know, that's amazing how many reporters seem to show up when there's a threat of military action. I guess they'll do almost anything to get their story, even if they have to go into harm's way. Well, they feel they have to keep the public informed about what we're doing. And, you know, apparently, as you just saw in that last story, the media admit they're really interested in telling the American public the accomplishments of our sailors and Marines around the world. Well, now, here's a story by Bruce Barry of WTKR-TV in Norfolk, Virginia. He was on hand when USS Dwight D. Eisenhower put to sea for an historic deployment to the Mediterranean. And here's what he told viewers in the Tidewater area. The first women were ported aboard Eisenhower last March. There are 240 now and another 145 in the air wing. They have been working together for eight months now, and frankly, they're not a little tired of hearing about it. We'd love it to be a non-issue. Um, I'm kind of here and would love for my job to, to see that it, it winds up being a non-issue. We're past the experimental stage with women in this ship, in this air wing, and in this battle group. You know, they are absolutely integral to what we're doing. But this will be the first full six-month cruise to the Met, and maybe to Bosnia, or back to the Gulf maybe into harm's way with an air wing that didn't go to the sudden Haiti mission. We could be very busy on this deployment, and I'm, I'm certain they will catch up. One of the things that I've noted with this air wing is that they are all super professionals. I just got back from Haiti about three weeks ago, and now it's off to the Met. Seems like a lot of time at sea, but not really. It turns out that the fleet exercise that turned into the Haiti operation was about the same amount of time. We got back from the Haitian operation on the same day we had planned to get back from our operations off the coast here. We definitely picked up the air ops here, so it was kind of like USS Oceana. <laughs> but I think we got plenty of flying in. Uh, I think we got all the checks in the block that we needed, and uh, we're ready to go. At Oceana, the A-6 crews of Attack Squadron 75 will fly back aboard the Ike at sea and get a lot of air time over the Atlantic. They've got to be ready for more than one scenario by the time they get to the Met. Bruce Barry, TV3 News. Thanks to Bruce Barry and WTKR-TV in Norfolk for providing that story. Now, the Ike may be the most visible combatant ship to deploy with women aboard, but it's not the only one, and it's not the first. For instance, four women are aboard the frigate Samuel B. Roberts on its deployment to South America, and one of those women has found the experience to be everything she thought it would be, and more. Airman Yvette Houghton. She fixes target drones aboard USS Samuel B. Roberts. That's the deployed Roberts on the UNITAS cruise around South America. As one of the first women to deploy on this combatant, Houghton knows she's a pioneer of sorts, and she says it's no big deal. We're treated like one of the guys. We are equal. The guys think things are going well, too. We get along real good. I was there. Like many women in the Navy, Houghton wanted to serve aboard a combat vessel. You might say she was eager. It's my first ship volunteered for this. She came aboard as part of the ship's air detachment, VC-6. But because of this deployment, she wants a full-time assignment to a ship and a rate change. I want to be a gunner's mate now. And she says going to sea on a combatant is a great opportunity for her. Some females might not want to. Some females might. I'm one of the ones that want to. One of the 
doing with the males too. You know, Chris, opportunities for women at sea are really growing. Are you ready to check out your sea legs? Definitely. I want to get aboard a submarine. I think it looks really neat underwater. A now. submarine, huh? I think you'd go for something like that. <laughs> well, when we return, the Commandant of the Marine Corps visits Marines on the West Coast. Stay with us. If you ever think you're not tall enough or tough enough, pretty enough or smart enough, or you don't want to try something because you feel you'll look awkward, if you think you'll never learn it or play it or figure it out, or you feel unsure because you're not quite the same, well, everyone gets these feelings. But if you believe them, you're selling yourself short, way short. A message from the U.S. Navy where we believe the only way to grow is to rise to the challenge. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. Sailors and Marines in San Diego recently hosted the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and his visit focused on the Corps' recruiting efforts. The Marine Corps, like the rest of the services, wants to get this message out. We're still hiring. During his visit to Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego, the Commandant of the Marine Corps told recruiters all over the country to keep recruiting quality Marines. We are people, the Marine Corps more so than any of the other services, and more so than any institution in America, uh, is people. We field people. We put people forward. We support them with a little bit of equipment. Junior personnel make up 49% of the Corps, so there's always a constant need for new Marines. Our primary force is the, uh, is the young E2, E3, PFC, Lance Corporal. And that's, uh, you know, that's where our focus of attention is at in the Marine Corps. And the more than 2,500 production recruiters are focused on filling 40,000 billets a year. So to repay them for their hard work, General Mundy presented the Superior Achiever Award to recruiting commands all over the country. RS New York, commanded by Major G.J. Penzak. Then it was off to a graduation, where the Commandant saw the quality Marines that are being recruited. Later, he met some of the new Marines, their families, and did a little recruiting himself. You're doing a lot for the Corps. Thank you. You got any more at home? This is it. That's it? That's all you got? Thank you. Well, thank you. The Commandant also talked about other issues that affect Marines on a daily basis, like quality of life, deployments, and other personnel issues. Even though his visit focused on recruiting, the Commandant wanted the Marines to know he's working for them. Progress is on the minds of the folks at the Navy Recruiting Command as well. There's a new Navy program that makes it easier for high school students to get their start in the Navy through the ROTC program. The Navy's changed the application process for the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps scholarships to help select highly qualified high school candidates. Recruiters can now offer top applicants a scholarship on the spot. Petty Officer Mark Kane tells us more. Now, did you talk to a, a Navy recruiter before? Recruiting in the Navy has increasingly become more important as right-sizing continues to call for quality, not quantity. Advertising is just one of the tools being used to get the best recruits into today's Navy. So, even if the NBA isn't in their future, I guess that's game. A BA is. For more information, call 1-800-USA-NAVY. But advertising isn't the only way the Navy's getting quality into its ranks. Another tool being used to recruit top-notch high school graduates into the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps is by offering them an on-the-spot NROTC scholarship, officially called the Immediate Scholarship Decision. That if the person meets all our requirements and is what we would call a blue-chip kind of candidate, very high SAT score, high in leadership in high school, um, high in class standing in high school, then, then that person won't have to wait for a long time to find out whether he or she's going to get a scholarship. These scholarships are worth anywhere up to $80,000. It's a, it's a good program, and uh, whereas in the past it might have taken a, a little bit longer to find out, you can find out either instantly with the ISD or within 10 days of, after receipt of the, uh, of the application by CNET. The final change to the NROTC program includes the ability for recruiters to accept applications from high school juniors after they complete their fall semester. These changes will give recruiters a definite advantage in recruiting highly qualified NROTC candidates. We're going to capture the attention of a lot of these kids and get them to go, wow, I've got a four-year scholarship to Morehouse or Hampton or Penn State or any number of the 125 universities that we have scholarship agreements with. And 
take away the temptation for them to take another scholarship because they've already got theirs secured with us. I would encourage our sailors, if they know anyone who might meet these, uh, these criteria, uh, to encourage them to contact their Navy recruiter and we'll take care of them. My name is Petty Officer Ross, I was told by Rodriguez Elmore that you were interested in the Navy. Petty Officer Mark Kane, Washington. The Chief of Naval Operations did some recruiting of his own during a trip to the Hampton Roads area. While in Norfolk, he talked to members of the Association of Naval Services Officers about the Navy's plan to recruit more minority officers. Then he showed them how the Navy's going to do it. This is one way the Navy hopes to improve recruiting, by giving on-the-spot college scholarships to high school students. Josephine's one of the first to benefit from the Navy's newest recruiting tool, called the Immediate Selection Decision. From the ANZO meeting at Naval Air Station Norfolk, Admiral Borda went to the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. He did a quality of life walk around the shipyard, checking out the child care center, though these children weren't impressed enough with the CNO visit to stop eating their lunch. And he got a look at rooms in the bachelor enlisted quarters. Then Admiral Borda wrapped up his shipyard visit by breaking ground on a new BEQ. Okay. After the shipyard, Admiral Borda spent time with the Gator Navy at the Naval Amphibious Base in Little Creek. A sailor at the CNO call in the base theater asked if the enlisted dungaree uniforms could be changed. Admiral Borda said no because... About half the people get real upset. About half the people say it's okay and get real quiet. And almost nobody jumps up and down and says, isn't this wonderful? I get to go to the uniform shop and spend a fortune. Then a couple of surprise visits, first to Assault Craft Unit 2. What do you do? I'm a yeoman. A yeoman? Oh, I'm an XPN. I'm sorry, I even shook your hand. We have a towel, I shook a yeoman's hand. That one just did Then he caught an unsuspecting bosun's mate by surprise. Beautiful 4 nines. so it's a showboat here. That's a showboat. Let's go look on the one that's not the showboat. It's not bad. How about you? Are you living on here? Uh, yes, sir. How many people do you got? Uh, we have a total of eight right now, sir. We're trying to push you up. <laughs> Take care. Nothing like the CNO popping up late in the afternoon to make you feel shot. Real shot. Why? <laughs> Uh, it's not every day you got the CNO come visiting your uh, craft personally, you know. Being a BM-3, usually you have a, a chief standing by, but being that was a BM-3, and let the CNO person to person, that's something. <laughs> we, this is a 30-foot rig that we towed, and we towed it from the uh, center line aft. Here Down at the piers, USS Tempest crew members briefed the CNO on their role in the Haitian operations, and after a quick re-enlistment, so Admiral Border went aboard the Tempest, then took the ship out for a spin. A couple of high speed runs in the Chesapeake Bay, then it was time to head for shore the CNO's way. Now, how'd you get back to shore? Oh, I hopped on a rib behind him, a much smaller one, mind you, and we were bouncing on the waves as we headed back in. It was a, it was a good ride, though, and he's a great driver. He likes a lot of speed out there. <laughs> well, when we return, we'll show you some ways to keep your holiday spinning within your budget. And the fleet returns to San Francisco Bay for this year's Fleet Week celebration. Stay with us. strong. To win, you've got to be smart. Maybe you can be one of us, the few, the proud, the Marines. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. Each year in the San Francisco Bay Area, citizens and community leaders devote one week to honor our nation's sea services. Petty Officer Ron Flanders followed the action and shows us sailors having fun in the Golden Gate City. Thousands of Bay Area residents lined the shores as the 14th annual Fleet Week kicked off with a parade of ships. Among the nine U.S. Navy ships who came under the Golden Gate Bridge this year were the USS Arkansas and the USS Gary, who led the procession while the Abraham Lincoln brought up the rear. 
Abe's launching of an FA-18 jet off her decks in the middle of the San Francisco Bay had never been done before. Oh, the launching of the aircraft from the carrier, we loved it. It's the first time I've ever been able to see that. And that, combined with an ensuing air show that included the Blue Angels, had Bay Area residents and sailors alike excited about Fleet Week. I think it's good public relations. I think the Navy needs to, it's good for the taxpayers to see what they're supporting, and it's, and it's good for people to feel a little patriotic and see the, the planes and the ships coming by. It's, it's something that, that, that civilians don't typically see. As you can see, the city of San Francisco's skyline is a very breathtaking sight. And for the Fleet Week sailors who pull in here, it's a welcome sight indeed because they know when they pull into San Francisco that they're pulling into some of the best stateside liberty around. Sailors strolled down the San Francisco city streets and enjoyed themselves all the way. It's great. I mean, it's very, you know, there's a lot of attracting, it's life, and it's pretty good, you know. Get to meet a lot of people. Another fun activity of Fleet Week is the wine tasting tour. Sailors got a chance to go up to the picturesque Napa and Sonoma Valleys and taste a little wine, but not only that, to learn some of the processes involved in the making of fine wines. We want to show people that wine is not just something you buy off the shelf for $10 a bottle. It goes all the way back to the vineyard. It's real important where the vineyard is located, how the grapes are trained on their trellis systems, what time you pick the grapes. There's a lot that goes into a bottle of wine that you don't see when you just pull it off the shelf. For me, it'll be beneficial for my job. This is uh, more, more business than pleasure today. The week-long celebration concluded with a rousing performance by the Marine Corps Silent Drill Team leaving the Bay Area military supporters applauding, as well as waiting for Fleet Week 95 to roll around. Petty Officer Ron Flanders, San Francisco. Now that looked like a lot of fun. I could do a week in San Francisco with Fleet Week. <laughs> well, with the holiday season just around the corner, many sailors, Marines, and their families will be doing a lot of shopping. Well, you know, you have to be careful not to overextend your budget when it comes to purchasing items on credit, especially during Christmas. Petty Officer J.C. Morgan from our Norfolk Detachment gives us a few ideas on how to keep holiday spending in check. <laughs> just a few months away and you haven't even started your shopping yet. You haven't set aside any money and now you're in a panic. So what are you going to do? More than likely you're going to charge it. But watch out, those sales receipts can end up choking the holiday spirit. Holidays are a period where uh, all the, the problems that people typically have during the year with their finances are magnified. They're spending a lot of, lot of cash in a short amount of time. They're doing a lot of impulse buying and uh, it's a very emotional time. Uh, they feel the need to go out and get gifts and things like that, and if they don't have the money in their savings accounts or whatever, they're going to go out and buy it however they can, and that's usually by using credit. Racking up big credit card bills can mean trouble in the future. Before you lay the plastic down, ask yourself if you really need the item, and can you pay when the bill comes due? There are several ways to get around the Christmas crunch. You can avoid using credit cards by utilizing home layaways or just plan ahead. The nice thing about, about financial planning for the holidays is that the holidays aren't a surprise to anybody, or they shouldn't be anyway. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea of when Christmas is going to be this year. Um, I know when it was last year, and I think it's going to happen again the same date next year. The key to avoiding the Christmas financial blues is as easy as making out your own list. First, decide who you want to buy presents for. Figure out how much you can afford for each person, and then stick to it. Try to use cash whenever you can, and remember, by having a list, you can shop year-round. What I do is I go shopping, like, a little bit during the middle of the year, around June, July, and, and it'll kind of stack up all the gifts so I don't run into, like, Christmas traffic and Christmas prices. And if you don't know where to start, talk over your financial game plan with your command financial specialist. Don't let this holiday season bowl you over. Petty Officer J.C. Morgan, Norfolk. It's not you when you do your Christmas shopping. No, it's thing. not. Oh. I, I don't like the Christmas shop, but that's some great info to keep in mind, especially when we're out there doing that Christmas shopping this mm -hmm. year. Oh, I know. I've already seen a few Christmas items out in the stores already, and it's uh, not even Thanksgiving yet.
Yeah, please. If you need help keeping your spending in check during the holiday season or any time, contact your command's financial counselor. They can help set you straight and get your credit on the right track. Now, Chief, you know that I really don't like to shop. I uh, mean, yeah. it, it's not that I don't like to shop. It's just I don't like to shop. <laughs> but in our next story, some sailors had a different idea of what to do during their time off. During the Navy birthday, many commands got together to celebrate over 200 years of naval history and tradition. And some sailors in Edsel, Scotland, jumped at the chance to explore the history and tradition of their host country at the Navy Ball. Petty Officer Bill Polson reports. It's that time of year again when American sailors around the world take their evening wear out of mothballs and suit up for the Navy Ball. Now normally you'd expect the guys to wear the pants for such a formal occasion, but we'd like to show you a place that does things just a little differently. Welcome to the 1994 Navy Ball in Aberdeen, Scotland. Find a navy ball and you'll see a room full of black ties and evening gowns. But there's one dress style, excuse the pun, that you'll only find at the ball in Aberdeen, which is held by the sailors and marines stationed about 40 miles south in the small town of Edsel, Scotland. It's the kilt. This is actually my first Navy Day ball. I, I was briefly at the one last year. I just showed up to talk to a few friends of mine. And, um, there were a lot of people wearing kilts, so when I showed up this year, I decided that I'd wear a kilt. Why'd you decide to wear a kilt tonight? Uh, because the Scottish tradition, you know, is the kilt, and we have the option of either wearing a dress uniform or a kilt. Kilt is a little bit more comfortable than a jumper, so that's my personal thing. If you notice, a lot of kilts and everything, but it's unique, whereas it's history in Scotland is just so much involved with, with uh, clan and, and the family and stuff like that and, and the kilts, the people are, are love the kilts. You can, you can rent, a lot of people rent their kilts that were just cheaper than re renting a tux. The complete Scottish outfit with the kilt costs about $450 and if that's too pricey, you can always go with the traditional navy uniform. A lot of the guys like to wear the kilts, you know, the traditional uh, attire formal of the Scottish community. But I don't know, I, I like to stay a little bit, personally, I like to stay more military, you know, bring the, bring the jumper out. Whether you go Navy Cracker Jack or Scottish Highlander, the Navy Ball in Aberdeen is a once in the world experience. Reporting for Navy Marine Corps News, I'm Petty Officer Bill Polson. Now that's an interesting twist on the Navy ball. Can you picture Marines going to the Marine ball in, not in, in my life, Not in my lifetime. Oh, no. Well, are you going to the ball this year? Well, I'm going to try to pick up my tickets today. Hopefully, I'll be able to make it. Mm, good luck. <laughs> well, that's our show for this week. I'm Christiana Halsey. And I'm Herb Josie. We'd like to thank all the viewers out there who've called in with comments on the show. If you have any ideas for stories that you'd like us to cover, please don't hesitate to call. Our Navy Marine Corps News feedback line is area code 202-433-6108, or you can call DS in at 288 6108. Just leave a message on the machine anytime, day or night. We listen to every call and we look forward to hearing from you. And don't forget, we also have an email address if you'd like to send us a computer message. Here's where to send the email. We leave you this week with another look at sailors and Marines participating in San Francisco's Fleet Week celebrations. Have a great week.